I want to welcome everyone to um, the sixth, I think, the number six and final Sound Studies Institute lecture for the 2021 fall term. Uh, we're coming to you from Amskwagi, Westkahagen, sometimes known as Edmonton, Alberta, which is in Treaty 6 territory, the traditional homeland of the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Diné, Ojibwe, Inuit, and many other indigenous people. Uh, so sound and music have been heard and created and celebrated here for thousands of years by many diverse First Nations and cultures. And tonight we wanna humbly add our sounds to this history with respect and solidarity. Uh, so welcome, if you're here for the first time, uh, the Sound Studies Institute is a research institute at the University of Alberta um, that celebrates and supports research into sound from all angles, including performative and artistic understandings of sound, i.e. music, but also other human and non-human understandings of the role of sound in our world. And today is December 1st, and I want to remind uh, everyone who might have been around here last year uh, at this time, around this time, our final Wednesday lecture happened to fall upon December 2nd last year, um, which is the birthday of Moses Ash, who is the founder and proprietor of Folkways Records. And if you know anything about SSI and its history, you'll know that this amazing collection of records uh, uh, that, we, that um, Moses Ash do, uh, donated uh, a very large portion of that collection to the University of Alberta. Uh, and we continue to shepherd that collection. Um, and in fact, you're gonna hear a little bit more about that history tonight, because uh, we thought it would be fun to invite Julia Bile back to, um, to talk a little bit more about her research in the creation of institutions um, that celebrate audio archives and history um, through some of her ethnographic practices. Um, and in this case, she's gonna talk a lot about um, the history of SSI and Regula Qureshi um, and some other things. And I wanna say too, just for fun, uh, this, this is the first SSI event that I am hosting from the inside of SSI. And I'm here um, not wearing a mask because I'm the only one in the space <laughs> right now. Um, and, uh, and in fact, just for fun, I'll walk over here uh, and you can all see the Moses Ash collection in real time. Here it is behind me. Um, hopefully that doesn't mess up your ability to hear me. Um, as I'm wandering around SSI with my laptop. But uh, during these difficult times, uh, we want to, uh, we, we just, we're excited to hopefully bring you all back <laughs> into the space. And so, as I mentioned, um, as I've mentioned previously in other lectures, we, we have the ambition to eventually uh, in January, in our, our, our next lecture in January, to open things up and create um, these events as a hybrid events so that we'll be able to continue to uh, provide uh, access to the lectures as we are now, that will not be changed, but for folks who are on campus and are able to come, we'll be able to host a, a few people live. So that's very exciting for us. Um, okay, so getting back to tonight's guest, uh, Dr. Julia Bile, um, she's gonna be talking to us, as I said, um, about um, creating institutions. Um, and in particular, some of the institutions built by Regula Qureshi at the University of Alberta. Um, and uh, Julia is a, an assistant professor in ethnomusicology at the University of Alberta. Um, and a week from today, she will become the president of the Canadian Society for Traditional Music. Um, I think that today, that maybe that today was earlier, I don't know, but <laughs> in any case, um, congratulations to her on that. Uh, Julia moved to Canada in 2015 after three years as a postdoctoral fellow at King's College London on Catherine Butler uh, Schofield uh, uh, European Research Council uh, project called Musical Transitions to Colonialism in the Eastern Indian Ocean. There, her uh, proudest accomplishment was a translation of a miscatalogued Jawi, hope I pronounced that correctly, poem about uh, Muharram and British uh, misdeeds in colonial Singapore in collaboration with David Lun, Jerry McCollum, and Raja uh, Isklander, bin Raja Halid. Her book, um, Antifunnel Histories, Resonant Pasts in the Toba Batak Musical Present was published in 2014 by Wesleyan University Press and based on her doctoral work uh, supervised by Judith Becker at the University of Michigan. 
Uh, with Jim Sykes, she is preparing a new edited volume, uh, Sounding the Indian Ocean, Musical Circulations in the Afro-Asiatic Seascape. Uh, Julia's newest ethnographic and archival project, Civic Modulations, is based uh, in Delhi, Delhi, East Timor, and explores uh, public music, uh, the individual and the transnational, transnational institution in one of the world's newest um, nation states. Um, but as I said, tonight, um, Dr. Bile is going to talk to us about regular Qureshi's work um, uh, and a few other things, I think, uh, and I'll turn things over to her. So let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, um, the week from Friday was actually two Fridays ago. So now I am the CSTM president. My daughter's sneaking in. Aloya, you got to give me some moments here. Can stink my tea, but that's about it. I ran up when um, Scott was talking because I wanted to show you this book, um, which is uh, written by one Michael Ash. Uh, and I'll explain this in a bit. Um, Michael Ash was, uh, is the son of um, Moses Ash, who is the you know, mind behind Folkways Records, who is in turn the son of Sholem Ash, who was a, um, uh, a, a Yiddish playwright of significant um, renown in Europe. And uh, among the, his, his, the things that he did, um, besides being connected with Folkways, there's an entire podcast all about Folkways. Um, done by Michael Ash, who knows this very, very well. My daughter is dealing with this, the spotlight right now. Um, but it, spotlight. Yeah, listen, shush. But in addition, um, talking about children and, <laughs> and adults and um, daughters and sons, right? In addition, he's the, the, the author of um, I'm Being Here to Stay, a, dis a discussion um, of Aboriginal rights and treaty rights in Canada, um, which I wanted to um, show to you. In fact, this was brought to, to my knowledge by Carly Ryan, who's in the audience right now. And this just goes to say the importance of um, Scott's acknowledgement at the beginning. I should say more specifically that the University of Alberta is on the land uh, originally occupied by, um, I think, pre Papas Chase uh, people, as well as Métis individuals, including Laurent Garneau, who used to play um, uh, Métis fiddle tunes within earshot of Con Hall um, when he lived there um, um, decades and decades ago. So anyway, that's the kind of music that is in our area. And I wanted to bring up um, Michael Ash's significant work towards reconciliation, as well as the fact that he was uh, Regula Qureshi's um, doctoral supervisor, as well as Carl Urian, who's in the audience's doctoral supervisor. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that, although not ab ab about Folkways as much. So I am going to share with you my screen. Um, and I uh, ha am at the time, I think as lots of us are, that if we don't put cogent thoughts on paper, they're not cogent. Um, and so I do have I have things written out, but I also try to break out into the slides as much as possible. So I'll begin now and I thank you for your kind attention. Uh, a tinsel clad Christmas tree, the flag of Pakistan and a carving that imitates West Coast indigenous material culture. A woman in a silk in silk evening wear, her expensive posture enhancing its sheen, a man in a suit and tie drawn into his recorder, recorder, a man wearing a topi, the flat hat characteristic of Pakistani officialdom, bongos at the ready. An improvised microphone slants across the space to amplify the recorder's modest woody sound. The drummer's dark rimmed glasses confirm the date of this photograph, 1966. The performance commemorates two Pakistani holidays sharing the same day. Outside of the picture's frame is a painting of Pakistan's founder, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, whose December 25th birthday is celebrated um, also as uh, Kaid e Azam Great Leader Day. Yet the immediate setting of the photograph most interests me. Although it hints at domesticity with its fireplace and pine paneling, the room is clearly an institutional space. No home needs a fireplace that big. The picture was taken in the University of Alberta Students Union building in a space created for the Waunaita Society, a club formed in 1908 by the university's female student body to create social support within a largely male institution. This explains that ersatz totem pole, like other contemporary clubs, 
White student sociability was constructed from caricatures of indigenous protocol, ceremony, and language, traditions that at the time were banned for the actual inheritors of these cultures, none of whom had joined the student body at this time. Considering this sketchy record of inclusion, the presence of South Asian individuals in the hair bear, hall bears notice. The ensemble that Dr. Regula Qureshi plays in for this is indeed the identity of the glamorous cellist, makes noise in the university hall, asserting some agency in the face of the silencing mentioned above. Regula Qureshi's presence at the university is partially due to her husband, Dr. Salim Qureshi, the Indo-Muslim political scientist she married a decade before. Four. When Salim took the job at the University of Alberta in 1963, he paved the way for South Asian academics at the university and with regular for South Asian families in Edmonton. Since their courtship days in the late 1950s, the couple's experience was a study in mutual borrowings of Marxist philosophy and Islamic mysticism, of Hindustani poetry and fine French wine. The result in erudition was both South Asian and Germanic, as became clear when Qureshi pursued her own PhD in anthropology on research that married her knowledge of Western classical music and her increasing facility with South Asian musical worlds. So this is the process that's been caught in the picture that you see. Uh, on closer inspection, Regula's glossy textiles are a sari, no less formal, but with a different provenance, and the recorder played by her neighbor, I suspect, is a Blockflotte brought to Canada from Switzerland, a German recorder. What could this music, scored for cello, recorder, and bongos, possibly have sounded like? And do these sounds, how do they connect to the University of Alberta? The province of Alberta is home to many rich musical traditions that have been unevenly integrated into academic programs and to musicians who have not always been served or even recognized by our institutions. In 1996, this concert would not have made it into the formal musical spaces of the University of Alberta. But 50 years later, accessing this image was easy thanks to a project with robust support by the university at all levels, the South Asian Music and Culture in Canada website. Let's see if that's what I have next. Um, this actually is a picture of the um, induction ceremonies of the Juanita Club. You can actually see the painting in the lobby um, going from uh, Hub Mall to um, the library. Um, and you can see very clearly this appropriation of, um, I mean, a, a approximation of some sort of indigenous um, culture. This is the South Asian Music and Culture in Canada example. It had been supported by federal and university grants. Um, and uh, in contemporary university auditoria across North America, the song from home of a Ukrainian immigrant, the sound of a Cree drum, or the recited poetry of an Indo-Muslim political scientist prof are all offered as proof of, int of efforts to integrate ethnomusicological perspectives into curriculums, grant applications, and concert lineups. Um, and so there's this idea that we've now achieved this place where you have a place for the bongos and recorder and um, poetry and indigenous drums played by indigenous people in places like Khan Hall, and certainly you do. Yet, what of concerts like that of December 1966, staged outside of a grand public space and creating discrete musical and social synergies that would not have been recoverable but for a chance snapshot? We must also consider ways of crediting the people who do not appear on the institutional website, both past and in the and present. Salim Kreshi, for example. Um, Métis scholar Dr. Carl Urian, a member of Gregory, was in consideration of Indigenous song long before she organized a place for it in a concert, um, or the diverse musicians at the annual concerts themselves, authors and sound of their own intellectual traditions. So this essay considers how best to tell histories of our institutions in a way that requires formal data to share space with the idiosyncrasies, exclusions, and promise of the cello bongo recorder concert and others like it. For crucially, it's the cumulative effects of fleeting moments of social intimacy such as these amongst people of different backgrounds with different levels 
to create the institutions that could program musical events for an audience, an inclusive public. So telling the history of these programs in a way that attends to both the structural and the ephemeral is, to a large extent, the telling of the expansion of what counts as music in Canada. So let's continue the conditional institution. Scholars studying bureaucracy in the modern institution have made note of the ways that serendipity, emotional resonance, and individual agency are edited out of institution history. The television, oh, it's called the, the social production of indifference. Hertzfeld, inspired by the scholarship of um, British anthropologist Mary Douglas, shows modern West state bureaucracy to be as willing as a non-Western fieldwork site. Um, and he, he talks about um, using those who are influenced by them. This is um, a case study from um, Br British mental health offices um, being studied by uh, two scholars, Armstrong and Agulnik. What they suggest is, quote, knowledge produced by organizations effectively conceals their operations, creating a sealed rhetorical universe. So noting a new advocacy for localized informal institutional models, Armstrong and Agulnik suggest that the recognition of individual agency and the operations of chance can create a more effective structure as well as more accurate histories. They say the notion of happenstance thus enables us to retain a sense that chance is social and makes links between individuals or institutions and their social surround independently of structuration or or habitus. Hertzfeld argues that the study of institutions requires more than the insights of business or international relations scholars. He says, I suggest that an anthropological sensitivity to immediate context, to ethnography, helps shift the focus away from perspectives that are already determined by the institutional structures they were set up to examine. Um, so beyond providing nuance about how institutions are formed, such, such an approach has considerable value for identifying the work of a broader, broader spectrum of contributors. Crucially, the search for informal associations, serendipitous connections, and the work of personal relationships can be a mechanism for finding and crediting the contributions of individuals unlikely to be formally recognized within organizations that are often structured for their exclusion. Moreover, recognizing the work of these individuals allows us to account for how um, broad inclusion can actually create institutional change. So I want to illustrate this point by moving outside of the University of Alberta to um, Indiana University to talk about the testimony offered by the career of ethnomusicologist Dr. Portia Moltzby. Um, and I have an interview of her with Dr. Alicia Lola Jones, also from Indiana University, both black female scholars. So what is happening is at the end of this interview, um, let me actually play this for you. Let me just um, dip out just a minute, stop my share and play this example for you of um, Dr. Alicia Lola Jones talking, uh, um, uh, talking to uh, Dr. Portia Maltzby. Okay, let me just talk to my child. Theo, can you please close the door, please, so I can concentrate? Let me hear it locking behind you. This is a sound studies event. I want to hear it locking and not opening. Okay, thank you very much. So here we have just a little bit of, um, of this uh, musical example. Uh, I think you can hear it. So let's hear, let's hear um, Dr. Paul, Portia Maltz be interviewed by Dr. Alicia Lola Jones. Ten years out from Southern depositing her dissertation you are interacting with her and through that interaction um, it illustrates how as we study black music research and its historiography we really need to attend to black women's lives mm -hmm. um, not just their lives through publication but also their lives in the doing of the research and in the pedagogy mm -hmm. um, because a lot of black women have been the teachers of those who went on to publish That's article right. and book length works mm -hmm. and your career in particular as a practitioner, composer, musician, um, administrator, uh, to to reduce it simply to publication is not to understand mm -hmm. the doing of the research. All right, could you all hear that? Give me a, a thumbs up in the chat if you did. Yeah, 
Okay, great, excellent. So let me continue with my um, with my PowerPoint. And um, uh, here we go. So. Um, uh, so this is this ethical commitment that recognizing Black women's lives, practices, spoken or sung words, and non-published work is an essential corrective to past instances where the intellectual work of these scholars was first captured in print by others due to structural exclusion. So I want to say that Maltzby and Jones are eminently accredited, institutionally affirmed scholars. Maltzby is the Laura Bolton Professor Emerita. Alicia Lola Jones just got tenure at Indiana University and now is moving to Cambridge in the U.S. Okay. They're expert within alternative formula, stru formula structures as well. Their performance of funk and gospel as well as masters of music theory and Italian diction. Ex uh, experts affirmed by the responses of Black audiences and acclaimed within our broader discipline earned as a function of that love lived experience. And Alicia Jones just um, won pretty much every possible prize at SEM and AMS recently. So when Jones introduces Maltzby in this um, interview as an apostle, she invokes this mode of authority that comes from the Black church, and we believe her. So that title is as significant as dean or director, and the institution must expand to accommodate such a lineage of cultural authority. So the picture of Maltzby's research that emerges from this podcast is of a career developed in relation with others, with mentors. Now I'm going to kind of um, move forward a little bit outside of my paper. This is the Archives of African American Music and Culture, which was um, built by Maltzby. And I'll explain uh, in a bit why Black music was um, understood as important at Indiana University. Now you don't really see her here as much. You don't see her name and her, her labor here, uh, although you certainly will if you dig in into the institutional pages. Um, but it, it has an African American scholar, leader, uh, and director. And so this is an institution in and of itself. Um, but when it first started, um, I want to bring up a couple of things. Number one, Portia Maltzby, and here she is um, as part of a, um, a band called Soul Syndicate. She was one of the first Black scholars who had a focus on African American secular music. So we're talking about funk and R&B, as opposed to gospel, or as opposed to Black classical or spiritual um, um, contributions. And this is really important because this there was quite a bit of pushback to this. And so here she is. I want to point out that in addition to being a scholar, um, working at places like, um, you know, I, I can't even begin, like every important African American um, uh, institution she has been involved with. Um, but she also is a uh, amazing performer and performed secular music with the Indiana University Soul Review, which is still playing now. So we think of music ensembles like Gamelan uh, at UCLA, but um, Maltzby started an African-American soul ensemble that allowed Black but also non-Black youth to, to develop their musicianship in different ways. So she has to be recognized as a performer in the tradition as well as a scholar. Um, and then I also wanted, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dip into that in, in just a bit. Oh, I wanted to talk about how Black music became understood as important at, at Indiana University. This was the story of happenstance, if you listen to Jones and um, Maltzby in conversation. What happened was when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, the Dean of the School of Music at Indiana University wanted to program a concert with African-American music, classical music, because that is what the, the School of Music did at that time. They looked at the library shelves, they found they had no scores that could be used for their choirs or bands, even though clearly, by the 1960s, there was obviously plenty of music written. And so there was this soul searching as a result that the institution was not inclusive that resulted in an Indiana University becoming this major research center for black um, vernacular as well as sacred music. So I should talk about Mel Dr. Melanie Burnham who um, had the Charles Seeger lecture at the at, uh, Society for Ethnomusicology this year who is a scholar at uh, IU in gospel. All right, so let's continue here. Uh, this is where we are going. Now, this is Salim Qureshi, and we'll leave him here until we actually get to him. So my point here is that despite their serendipity in um, Maltzby's description, but um, despite uh, the, the institution conferred recognition 
but was not responsible for her research, which she had long ago initiated as a performer and an analysis, an analyst and a scholar. So I was curious about uh, Maltzby's career because I was thinking about this idea of serendipity and relationships being one way of understanding institutions. And yet at the same time, I did not want to go ahead and posit that black building or indigenous building or um, um, non-white building of institutions was not powerful in and of itself. So I was very, really careful to not want to make my point too broad without doing the work. Yet, expanding its institutional histories to include the, the informal, the relationship, the relational and the serendipitous does significant work here as well. For one thing, paying attention to how institutions developed, especially when they might not have, requires us to remember histories of exclusion in our efforts to inscribe the importance of structural inclusivity. We need to hear the story of the Juanita room or the empty music library shelves to remember why we need indigenous and black scholars to run institutions and why we need reparations for colleges built through slave labor and for the trauma of residential schools. We see structures transforming before our eyes when, for instance, Maltzby recounts Bernice Johnson Regan's insistence on storytelling, this is a Black practitioner and scholar, on storytelling rather than listening um, in a formal script in an NPR audio series on Black music. Um, Maltzby says, we had to stop for a moment for NPR to regroup. Uh, she said, uh, Maltzby wanted, uh, sorry, uh, Regan wanted to talk about narratives and story and bring that into the interview format itself and NBR didn't have a mechanism for doing that. Um, or when Jones asserts the need for recognizing oral transmission as well as publications, as scholarship, she says, to do black music is to be relational, to be communal, to be oral. So even citing a podcast like I just did, and if you follow the links, you can hear their voices more, is itself a way to attend to these demands of counting things beyond what normally counts in our structures. So in this essay, I'm interested in thinking uh, about, and I use essay here, right, like a trial, I suppose, um, of how, uh, and uh, how the University of Alberta has played a role in, ex in promoting an expanded academic interface with the Canadian public in the field of musics. So I'm going to start by talking about um, Regula Cresci and Salim. And here's Salim here, um, uh, and we'll talk about that right now. So this part of the talk is called South Asian Music in the Rumpus Room. So Regula Qureshi arrived at her musical vocations through the drawing rooms and basement recreation spaces of her families, her birth and marriage families. Now known as an expert sarangi player, she's also a performer of another stringed instrument, the cello. So she played both the cello at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia and the srangi, which is a South Asian um, stringed instrument. Um, and she joined the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra as well in 1964 um, and was a soulful virtuoso. So um, the, the, what's interesting is that the Qureshi's acquisition of knowledge about the Sarangi and its cultural milieu, because she became a published a writer on um, South Asian music, inverts the standard narrative of the professional ethnographer. Unlike the stereotypical graduate student who identifies a topic based on curiosity and then works to make it real through field research, Qureshi learned South Asian music and poetry to acclimate to her home life as the wife and daughter of a family of Indian intellectuals. So she picked up the Sarangi in Lucknow, India, because she was bored to occupy her time, and she learned Urdu, the language that would ground her later research in Kavali music, to, to communicate with her new family. And she polished it by listening to the cadence of poetry while seated next to her husband, Salim, in, in Karachi. So here is Salim, and again, I don't want to assume that this is only an informal um, type of contribution that he's made. Here he is as a professor at the University of Alberta in the political science department, and this is absolutely important. But I also, oops, uh, let's see here, want to show um, some other ways in which we can understand him. So this is regular Qureshi's a uh, Yap Kunst Prize winning, winning uh, article for the best article pub published in ethnomusicology. I believe it was in 1969 that she got the prize. Um, she had not yet start, uh, she was not yet a graduate student at this point, which is really important to recognize. And if you look at the actual writing, you do not see Salim Kreshi 
in these in this writing, um, because at this time, um, humans, writers, authors, and especially women, um, were loath to bring the underseams of their research into um, into the publication. This didn't happen until the eighties in anthropology, the nineties in ethnomusicology. But if you look at the at the uh, examples out of I think thirty seven of them only 14 were taken outside of Edmonton. So here you have Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, um, uh, Ansar Hussein, an amateur poet of Karachi, formerly of Lucknow, um, but it's recorded in Edmonton, this one at the bottom, same. And there are, I think there are 35 examples, and some of them are example 2A and 2B. Um, this is Regula Kreshi, she does amazing work. Um, and yet what you are, uh, what most people assumed is that this was work that she did out of the field using her scholarship training from a, a graduate student. But in fact, this is before she was a graduate student and this was knowledge that she gained domestically. All right, so um, before we go any, oh, this, well, this is an example. Sorry, I'm having a hard time. Oh, I think I just have a clip. Uh, so this is 1967, an example of one of the recordings that um, she, um, uh, re recorded and perhaps used for an example. And there she is sitting next to Salim Qureshi um, as they uh, engaged with a domestic uh, practice that was part of a South Asian community in, in Edmonton. So I'm gonna stop my share for a moment because I thought I would play you just a couple of, arc, uh, of clips from a film that I recently, uh, that I'm still editing on regular Qureshi and on Salim, so you can have a bit of a break from listening to me, I suppose. Um, so let's uh, find this and share it. I, I'll just give you two brief clips uh, for this. <clears throat> Here's the first. Actually, I'm gonna fast forward a bit. Because I love music, I had to understand that music to make a sense out of anything else in the country. And that really got me started on the idea that... Sorry, let me go a little bit further. Okay, I think you... The Indian culture came with my marriage. Because I love music, I had to understand that music to make a sense out of anything else in the country. And that really got me started on the idea that music is something that reaches out across cultures. the part where I'm playing piano rather badly with regula and get to the bit if I can to where I'm talking and bringing in some of the archival footage. Okay, thanks. When I came to the University of Alberta three years ago, I knew Regula Qureshi. I had read her work in a graduate seminar run by Judith Becker. I cited her work in the first book review I ever wrote on Southeast Asia, which tells you her breadth. She could have been at any leading ethnomusicology program in the world. 
But when I came to the U of A, I realized that it wasn't an accident that she was here, and it wasn't an accident that this place produced her amazing scholarship. Her work is fundamentally connected with the community and the members of that community that she found in Edmonton, in Canada. The type of engaged public work that, that this city, that this university supports. Regula Qureshi was a public ethnomusicologist before it became fashionable. And luckily, we have her archive to prove it. Her house parties from 1968 that maybe weren't originally meant as field work. They were just a record of a wonderful evening. But they become as important as her field work in Karachi or in Lucknow. They show the same tenor of lived experience and how that creates the insights that come through so strongly in her work. This is as important as anything that she's written, and it has formed what she's written. The field can be the living room as well as the shrine. All right, so that's the first. Um, and then um, let's see if this will let me get to the second without, uh, nope, I think it just stopped it, so. Let's um, share another example that I wanted to show you. Uh, this is from later in the film where she's talking about um, her, how she learned poetry in um, Urdu um, uh, poetic gatherings in her basement. And so it, it starts with just a kind of um, uh, example of this. And then she talks about how she learned this. So I'll play a bit of this for you. This is footage from an Edmonton versus Calgary poetry slam, basically. But it has an interesting aspect in that the ending um, uh, letter of each couplet becomes the starting letter that the next group has to determine. So anyway, the, here's this, I'll play a bit of this. खाक बरसर चलो खून बदामा चलो राह तकता है सब शहरे जाना चलो आज बाजार में so you're going to hear the next person doing this, and then you're going to hear Regula singing. And what I want you to notice is how she's corrected, but also supported by her husband Salim. Wow. वो चार अगर भी उसे देर तक न पहचाना, वो चार अगर भी उसे देर तक न पहचाना, जिगर का जख्म था, नगमों में ढल गया मेरे ये सुबह की सफेदियां ये दो पहर की जल्दियां मैं आई नाम में आई ने में ढूंढते देखता हूं मैं कहां चला गया اقوال पर निगाह कर अफकार पर न जा اقوال पर निगाह कर so let's fast forward a little Music bit. Studies. I found that there was such a thing as a mushaira, mm -hmm. that is a gathering of poets reciting verses. Salim, he loved mushairas, he loved poetry and knew lots of it. When I did my abitur, you know, my high school essay, mm -hmm. I wrote on poetry and the art song like Schubert and mm -hmm. so on. Leader. Yeah. Goethe, leader, yes. Mm. I guess this audience would know what leader yes. was. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm. So that was the center of literature, mm. poems set into music. And so for me, I was very happy to jump into this milieu of these wonderful emotions, the shared feelings that people had and how they expressed it in poetry. The people who came to Edmonton or to Canada, they wanted to get together and enjoy the solidarity and whatever those feelings are mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. through reciting. Those were poems of loss, mm -hmm. poems of, uh, you know, na, 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 na. nostalgia maybe? Nostalgia, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. There wasn't partition, but it was an immigration, was mm. also 
a new land. Mm -hmm. And as a result then, the Mushaira was the place where these all these feelings could find expression mm -hmm. and where people could share them together. Because at the end of every recitation of a poem, the Pakistani or Indian way of responding and of making a strong answer. Wah, wah, wah. Mm -hmm. For me, it was very moving to see how a poet could get up and recite something that's clearly from the heart and that was also excellent poetry. Mm -hmm. Generally, is the first line of the couplet is a question or um, something that requires an answer <laughs> or a contradiction mm -hmm. or something. An outstanding couplet coming to a conclusion. It can bring the listeners to complete ecstasy and they can all, maybe they'll stand up. I mean, in, in the West, people would stand up for this. This is the style of listening to a Mushaira. Mm -hmm. It was real emotion of people getting together mm -hmm. to do something that was worthwhile. And this all right, so um, that was regular, bringing people to their metaphorical feet, right? So crucially, Qureshi's sing significant strides towards understanding Indian music were taken at Edmonton as she learned Indian music theory and tabla technique from members of the South Asian community. In effect, many of the rudiments of Qureshi's work on South Asian musical context were gained through the methodology of family and community-based applied ethnomusicology, although it would not be named as such for a while longer. So the two archival images um, that I showed you, uh, the one of them sitting at the Mushaira and then the one in um, uh, the, um, the, the building, um, they're part of SAMP, that South Asian Music and Culture in Canada project, a website that, that Kreshi and Michael Frischkoff brought to life in 2009. It houses the extensive archive compiled by the Kreshis, dating back to reel to reel recordings from the 1960s, and it also chronicles the developments of three Edmonton institutions with whom regular cultivated relationships, the Edmonton Ragamala Music Society, the Baza Mesukan Literacy and Cultural Society, and the Indo-Canadians Women's Association. These were all associations and institutions built within South Asian networks. But although SAMP is formal, the acronym SAMP is a dead giveaway, that's the website. Its assets document the tenor of musical life. Through the website, I found pictures of friends and neighbors listening to poetry together and spotting a tape recorder on the floor. I went to look for the tape. Um, and it record, has music and poetry, but the sounds of children and gossip. And uh, through engagements with these sources, I came to realize that the living room or the community lounge may be a site for field work as meaningful to Qureshi's work as a shrine. So this is the idea of domestic ethnomusicology. And yet a canvas of Qureshi's published work shows very, very little information about this. Um, uh, so you can find Salim if you look hard, but it hasn't opened it up yet for that. Her, uh, however, um, uh, Qureshi's model of domestic scholarship opened up possibilities for others. Um, for instance, uh, Michael Frischkoff's research on Arabic music, which was conditioned by the poetry of his wife. Uh, my own scholarship on island Southeast Asia is constantly under peer review by my husband, Sumatran musician Makarios Sitangan. It's no accident that the intellectual expansion of our domestic lives spurs us to create institutions that recognize the value of this knowledge. It's responsive to community governed by the personal. And an evaluation of the ways that domestic and community lives shape academic careers and insights is really long overdue, as is the supplementary story of just how regular Qureshi, chalice sarangi player, scholar, became so very erudite. Now, the point that I'm making here is that not very many people know who Salim Qureshi was um, in my field. Uh, this is pretty much new information for anybody who's not in Canada. 
So before I wa wax eloquent on the liberating possibility of domestic ethnomusicology, I do well to recognize the crucial corrective of the scholars who have long lived at the intersections of home and field. If Kreshi's acknowledgement of her husband in the text of her ethnography would have been difficult and undermined her authority, consider the difficulty for a scholar of color, quote, a culture bearer, a tradition bearer, this is the words of Melanie Burnham from Indiana University, whose research field is their domestic life. So as Daniel Brown states in her open letter on racism and music studies of 2020, um, remember for years it was fashionable to suggest that BIPOC uh, could not be objective when studying their own cultures. This despite the fact that Western music has been taught in schools predominantly from a Euro centric perspective using books written by white people. So Qureshi's married identity alone or Frischgauss or mine does not satisfy Brown's critique, nor did, um, nor did something that I just wrote above, which was the idea that the stereotypical graduate student goes out into the field um, and finds knowledge there. What happens if this is somebody who actually is part of that field from the beginning? White scholars have the option of naming or not domestic sources, of engaging or not with ethical imperatives um, of applied ethnomusicologies. Similarly, white institutionalists tend to believe that institutions founded in white legitimacy can stand for the general, while those like Maltzby's African American Archives of Music and Culture can only stand for the particular. In her blog, Feminist Killjoys, feminist and critical race scholar Sarah Ahmed points to the inevitable rewards of such a system. She says, how then is white men built or even a building? Think about it. One practitioner relayed to me how they named buildings in her institution. All dead white men, she said. We don't need the names to know how spaces come to be organized so that they can receive certain bodies. We don't need the naming to know who, how or who buildings can be for. So Ahmed's um, insight brings to mind the Wainita Society, that white female student club that provided the backdrop for that 1966 event I started with. The club was originally housed in Pembina Hall, one of a trio of buildings built in 1911, christened with indigenous names. Um, and uh, in contrast, the first indigenous student graduated from the University of Alberta in 1967, according to Carol Ryan. Pembina Hall is now home to the Faculty of Native Studies, but still encodes a reminder of white women women's ability to shape buildings. The register likely thought of as a gracious and community-minded one. Carved into the stone lintels of two external doors are the phrases of the Juanita motto, supposedly in Cree, um, probably influenced by Alexander Dumas. Payok uche kakayo, kakayo uche payok, all for one and one for all, except that the grammar is botched and unintelligible. And at the University of Alberta, white women's sociability and a willful misreading of indigenous community can also be a building. So I end this section with a cautionary tale because it's taught me specifically about overreach and complacency, even in the liberated domain of public ethnomusicology. When I realized the wealth of history that that SAMP music website contained, I set out to gain permission from South Asian community associations to work with their digitized assets and revive the collaborations founded by Qureshi. Easy, I thought all these organizations were already listed as partners. My intentions were plain. I wanted to promote their work but I found out rather quickly that there are no shortcuts to community-based research and that credentials and trust earned over decades of shared experiences cannot transfer. So attending a board meeting or addressing an AGM is different than the work of creating collaborative relationships over phone calls and visits to the other side of town, despite stalled cars, misread sig signals and hints untaken. So I've been so far unable to revive a relationship with one of Qureshi's key partners. Um, and also when profiling another one, I was told that I was centering the wrong person for the story. And I left the how home with a list of South Asian names that did not appear in SAMP and that were not regular Qureshi, but were foundational to an alternative community history. So I don't blame this community for doubting, like Daniel Brown, the fitness of distance white scholars to tell their stories for the right reasons. Although institutions can appear solid, they can also easily be dissolved. Their durability depends on fruitful 
personal relations and individual trust. Alliances and even the institutions created to formalize them can unravel with dizzying speed and perhaps they should as an incentive to constantly renew the collaborative work that will sustain them. So I'm going to move out of my paper for a bit. I'm gonna to return to it just for a really brief conclusion um, to go into kind of what I was inspired to do while searching today for more of Paul Portia Maltzbier's research. And I was made to think about the old, the buildings that I and my education had been a part of. And I wanted to recognize some teachers in my life that I'd never really credited as I should have even when I wrote this article. So um, I was inspired here because Maltzby went to the Netherlands in 1998 as a visiting professor at Utrecht. And she found there a woman um, named Edith Castellane who um, uh, uh, promoted four different gospel choirs that she saw as being a part of in the tradition. Um, and she had this as her next research project. So clearly, in uh, Aloya, close the door, please. Clearly influenced by black music, but there is an expansiveness based in relation that does not stop at identity because she brought um, these, these choirs into her research focus. So my first choral conductor was a black professor um, at Kelvin College named Dr. Anton Armstrong. This is when I was in fifth grade. Um, he's now the Harry R. and Thora H. Tostel Professor of Music at St. Olaf College. Um, and uh, Portia Maltzby's doctoral advisor was Lois Anderson, Professor Emerita at the University of Wisconsin. There's Melanie Burnham right next to her. And you can see that she is being affirmed in the tradition because of the ways in which she mentored and found places for Portia Maltzby to shine. And as a result, Maltzby credits Anderson at every single stage. You can hear about Lois Anderson through her, um, through her ideas. But it's not just about her being a professor at the University of Wisconsin, it's about her being a music teacher. We think that somehow it's more prestigious to be a professor than a music teacher. But what can be better than a teacher of music and a mentor? So Dr. Anton Armstrong, my music teacher, my mentor who shaped me as a singer when I was um, starting at, at 10 years old, um, the building that now I think of when I think of him, not as an all white space of the St. Cecilia Society in 1906, but as the place where I was mentored by Dr. Anton Armstrong. Similarly, my elementary school teacher, a music teacher, Alice Finley, who first introduced me to um, musical identification of Brandenburg concertos, of um, water music, of Debussy's Sunken Con Theater, uh, cathedral was uh, uh, is a black gospel inflected music teacher and here she is um, on stage at the DeVos Theater in 2010 playing a role in Porgy and Bess. So clearly we're not talking about differences and cleavages and um, separations of repertoire or ethnicity or race if we can come up with mentoring practices that moves between these. And as a result, when I think of my building, Oakdale Christian School, which was a, was a very, very diverse place in the 1970s and 80s when I went there, I think of this mentor who allowed me to be part of this, all right? So how does space come to be organized so that they can receive certain bodies? We can see here that if we have mentorship as an example, that this um, can overcome even things inscribed in the stone lintels. Now, what's key here is you can see that when Maltzby is talking about the research that she did, why did she see Castellan as doing important work? She did not simply use African-American repertoire to teach her choir. You can see Maltzby writing here. For example, she begins rehearsals with a prayer followed by a medley of praise songs, and then a rigorous 2.5 hour rehearsal taught through traditional oral methods instead of using notated music, which concludes with a prayer. And the last rehearsal of the season is pre preceded by a potluck dinner, an unknown concept in the mainstream Dutch society. Now I know this because this place, Oakdale Christian School, is a Dutch reformed school that was originally built to house Dutch uh, reformed um, uh, churches. I'm a part of a Dutch immigrant community. And we should just say that the my ancestors colonized the ancestors of my husband, who is from Sumatra, which was formerly the Dutch East Indies, right? Um, and yet, through work like this, you can move to a place where you can come uh, and have shared intimacy and community and knowledge in the tradition um, beyond these strictures. So to conclude, 
serendipity, a guiding theme in this discussion, sometimes arrives in a way external to human perception, only evident after it's done its work. I like to think it might arrive on the sound wave, considering the following set of coincidences. The vice president of research of the University of Alberta, who who spurred the creation of Folkways Alive in 2003, which later became the Sound Studies Institute where we are all gathered today, um, was inspired after hearing Regula Qureshi's concert, um, a, a concert uh, that she put on of music from Folkways and then realized through live performance. And he was inspired when he heard this, but that inspiration may have been conditioned by hearing Folkways rec records broadcast over the radio when he was an, a, a, a youngster on the Canadian Plains. Years later, the institution that he made possible, the SSI, is supporting the project of Métis scholar Carl Urian, studying how local indigenous people engage with the tradition of black gospel music, a tradition that is in Alberta. And he draws on the work of Melvin Butler, who is the advisor of Alicia Lola Jones, who did the interview with Portia Maltzby. So what's interesting is that if you know anything about the history of black music in Alberta, you'll know that Frank Oliver of the neighborhood Oliver was really fundamental in blocking um, African Americans from to moving to the Great Plains for agricultural work, um, basically extending the great migration into Canada because of his racism that was also based in anti-Ukrainian and anti-indigenous rhetoric. Um, and yet, um, uh, effectively, the expanded inclusivity of the VPR research that he set in motion has allowed Urian to offer a stinging rebuke to Frank Oliver, who successfully lobbied in the very period of the University of Alberta's founding to appropriate Indigenous lands in Edmonton and keep Black migrants from inhabiting them, or so Oliver thought, unless you consider the free range of sound waves. Um, the sound waves of the gospel quartet that Carl um, wonderfully um, brought to this Canadian Society for Traditional Music conference uh, just a week ago. So happenstance and radical access have collaborated here, and they might again, when the next listener is inspired by folkways records or anything else, and the institutions that still give them play. So crucially, these listeners and singers and dancers can help to shape these institutions, even if this shaping is in, in initially unacknowledged. So consider uh, Michael Fishkoff's description of the musical enfolding of Syrian refugees within Edmonton's larger Arabic community at the zenith of the Syrian refugee crisis in 2016. So the following excerpt is published in a dialogue based on the president's roundtable of the Society of Ethnomusicology um, and about interview uh, 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 accounts of refugees, which um, uh, Frischkoff says, quote, the interactions of social macrostructures within a dehumanized and dehumanizing system overriding the humanity of individuals. But Frischkoff argues that human nature of music can counter such dehumanization through social resonance. So he recalls a performance of a university music group that he leads, Mename, um, at a hotel that housed recent Syrian refugees. And this is what he says, refugees took the mic. They sang and we played, someone recited poetry. We clapped and danced. One of the refugees, Yahya, pulled out a midwiz Im, uh, emitting a, um, a um, uh, reedy, unbroken serpentine line that electrified the crowd and included an induced a sinuous dabka line dance, physically connecting us together. Subsequently, several refugees joined Maname. So although the description begins with the rapid unfolding of performance in the moment and develops with the serendipitous appearance of an instrument, likely a pot prized possession to be brought all the way to Edmonton, this excerpt ends with an institution. The ensemble, Miname, is also known as Music 148, 448, or 548, depending on your skill level. Its requirements are laid out in a syllabus. It confers credit to degree seekers at the University of Alberta. But reading Frischkoff's description, we become aware that it is also a community ensemble, a domestic ensemble, and an ensemble based based on sound, whether the com sound communities, whether the communities of Egypt, where Michael, the teacher, gained his musical knowledge, the community of Albertan refugee or students that benefit from it, or the Edmonton community of refugees, now perhaps citizens, that reanimates this musical knowledge through embodied sociability. So the, quot the quotation that I'm ending with 
should be enshrined in the Manami syllabus, should be enshrined at Khan Hall when Manami plays, um, uh, this concert program where new audiences are introduced to new soundscapes. But in addition, I hope it might spur us to tell histories of the other institutions that we know in a way that pairs the memorandum of understanding with the Damka, the buildings made of stone with the land-based practices surrounding them, and the hierarchy of the board of directors with the egalitarian spirit of Regula Kreshi and Salim. Thank you, everybody. Wow, thank you so much for that. That was really inspiring and thought provoking. And <clears throat> we're already at eight o'clock, but I, I just, that time just flew right by. I didn't even, I didn't even realize it was so late. <laughs> well, we started a little late. So we I took a little, a little liberty. And, and anybody who's been coming to these lectures knows that even though we make a lot of noise at eight o'clock, we actually keep going a little bit more. So, so we'll keep, we'll do that again tonight. Um, thank you so much for that great talk. Um, and I wanna just open it up for questions now, uh, as usual. Um, I think Tom has made it possible for you to unmute yourself. If you have a question, you can also raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, and we have, uh, looks like, oh, Tom is doing a thumbs up, not a, <laughs> not a hand wave. So anyone. Any questions? Uh, we have a question from Kim. Please, please go ahead. Hi, Julia. Thank you so much. I'm sure you're tired of my questions, um, but. I'm, I just, as I was listening to your presentation, um, I was really thinking about um, participatory research and this whole thing about connecting with community. And, and I was just wondering about your thoughts about um, actually engaging, like, are you, are you wanting to be going in to be doing some actual PR work? Is that something that you're thinking about with, with, these connections that you're making or is it just is at this point is it just this bridge building that you're working on or, or getting to be known in the communities well that's a good question i mean uh, the interesting thing is that i never considered myself to be uh -huh. an applied ethnomusicologist because i work with archives and the, the people <laughs> who created my archives which are from the 18th century are no longer present, although their descendants are certainly. So I had this fiction that the work I did was somehow exempt from this type of um, methodology. But it became really clear to me when I moved to Canada that there was no way I could ethically separate myself from the imperative to engage with communities. And this was, I think we can really point to indigenous based research as being the leader here. For instance, the idea that you do not come to a community with a project that you already have developed. You have to engage with the community and figure out what is to their benefit or what people are interested in talking about. You never do research on indigenous communities. There's an ethical imperative to do them with indigenous communities. And that specific specificity of living here on Treaty 6 land spurred me to think about this um, and also recognize that there's an ethical responsibility to our elders. We don't treat older people well here in our neoliberal university economy where they basically put their stuff in boxes and they get put in the basement. We do not um, uh, we do not recognize them often as elders in 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 white academics institutional spaces. And we also don't recognize the ways that they pass down their knowledge through a syllabus, through pedagogy, through a conversation as counting, right? And so it was the caretaking that I realized needed to be done for a regular Qureshi before it became, it was beyond recall, that really made me um, realize that this is something that is an ethical practice. It's not just an ethical framing, but it's the practice of ethics for anyone doing ethnomusicology is to get involved in this work. But what I will say is that it should be slow so that you really should spend years gaining trust and engagement and language 
or networks before you begin your grant and before you begin your research. This slow research is not just a, a kind of kind way to be as a scholar and a human, but it's the only way to really create relations. So my guess is that come back to me in 10 years and see what I produce. Um, in collaboration with others. You'll count how seriously I take this by the number of co-authors that I have on my papers. And I hope that they will be considerable because um, as I said, it's an issue of ethics. So thanks for asking, Kim. I hope that answered your question. Thank you for that. Um, thank you, okay. Uh, so now I think we have a question from uh, SH. Who is S.H.? <laughs> <laughs> okay, hi, Julia. This is Shamila. Shamila Himani. Sorry. Hi, I'm, Shamila. I'm, <laughs> I, I am logging in from my phone and my Zoom seems to have just S.H. on it. So Thank anyhow, I, I, <laughs> I joined your conversation a bit later because it's... Um, it's a different time zone here, uh, but I was, it's quite, it was quite amazing, uh, very inspiring, insightful stuff and brought back a lot of memories of, you know, the film that you've made and all, all the um, amazing memories of uh, the process of making it after uh, Professor uh, Celine Qureshi passed away and uh, you were involved in, in this project. Um, one thing that struck me uh, was when you mentioned you know, um, how you were introduced, I mean, when, when you came to University of Alberta and, uh, um, you know, you mentioned that Regula could have been in an, any, any um, well-known ethnomusicology program um, in the world or in the West or in the, in the North America. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was wondering there at that juncture, uh, if, if, if um, uh, you've looked into how uh, Regula established the program in ethnomusicology because this was some of part of the meet some of the meetings of the CCE long time ago in 2008 or 9 when Steve Feld even came for um, a talk uh, because Steve Feld and Regula sort of had their uh, similar trajectories in the sense that they did their degrees in anthropology there was nothing like ethnomusicology uh, then and they de did their degrees in anthropology and uh, then went on to establish uh, music programs, you know, music of the non-West or ethnomusicology within the music department. So that in itself is an interesting trajectory that many ethnomusicologists uh, 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 they don't you know, know. Uh, followed. Yeah, like yeah, uh, I, I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure, but Kay Shelley made did founded the ethnomusicology program at Harvard. Steve Feld uh, founded the ethnomusicology program at his university. I don't know, uh, it was Indiana or some, not Indiana, but some, some, somewhere else. So those trajectories of, um, of uh, you know, of, of music research. Um, so that was, that was one thing that came to my mind. And the second thing that, uh, that struck me was, you know, regular studied with, um, um, Michael Ash's son, uh, sorry, Moses Ash's son, Michael Ash. Uh, Michael Ash, you know, his recordings are, are, were part of, uh, are, are, are the sort of the foundational collection of the folkways. So, so that trajectory is also important mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, the, the establishment of folkways live. So that these are, and, and then thirdly, um, uh, when regular was, studying music with Moses, uh, with Michael Ash at University of Alberta. One thing she mentions that, um, uh, that, that was always, that was always uh, uh, you know, an issue, let's say, or uh, for ethnomusicology, for future ethnomusicologists was trying to, you know, justify the things that they were doing uh, in, in, in context to music, to justify it in context to, um, anthropology. I don't know if mm. I'm, I'm I'm wording it correctly. I'm yeah. wording it properly, uh, but it, you know, the kind of questions Mose, um, uh, sorry, the kind of questions Michael Ash would ask Regula about why such a thing is important. Why is this important? Why is that important? That you know, for a musician or for a music-oriented person, yes, it seemed fascinating. But for a person, for for you know, uh, a, a large you know 
you know, uh, within the larger anthropological anthropological discourses, that was always one of the one of the issues. So there was, I suppose, more freedom that was found in the establishment of a separate uh, discipline and program at uh, in 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 the universities. So well, these were just kind of couple of suggestions or questions, uh, yeah. something that you feel whether you've looked into and um, and so forth. Yeah. Thank you, Shamila. You're absolutely right that um, recognizing Regla as an anthropologist is not something that many people do um, because she is such a fabulous musician and had training in Western classical music. I am certain that the fact that she had it was a Curtis trained cellist was one of the things that allowed her to be accepted at the University of Alberta. It really helps to have that European prestige in your back pocket. But you're right that the training is absolutely um, uh, uh, relevant, and if you think of her work on labor, for instance, you can very clearly see the lineage um, from um, from Michael Ash, as well as the fact that Michael Ash studied at Columbia, right? All of uh, all of this, as well as folkways, and I'll say that in the article, that is um, kind of what I drew from for this. Um, I do spend a long time talking about folkways, about von Hornbostel, about um, Ash, and also I bring up. Scott Smallwood and um, uh, Henry Cowell. <laughs> so the, the lineage of sound and sound composition also comes in there. The last thing I wanted to say was, yes, this idea of how an individual forms an institution. It, it really is this kind of ecosystem. We think of ethnomusicology as being the same everywhere it's taught. But of course, Indiana with folklore, folklore and folk life being connected to it and in UCLA where the School of Music is kind of apart from ethnomusicologists, whereas in the, um, uh, Michigan or Illinois, you have musicologists and ethnomusicologists all together. There's really different trajectories and it's important to understand lineages. So for that, I'll just say that you, of course, are in the lineage of Regula Qureshi because she was your dissertation advisor. So you then are also connected to Michael Ash and Sholem Ash and the Columbia University Anthropology faculty. Mm -hmm. Thanks for um, that. I see a comment by Carl, can I read it out? Yes, please go ahead. So I um, keep thinking of how you showed it wasn't just serendipity, but agency in recognizing the opportunity that serendipity provided to work sometimes at great odds to transform organizational structures. That is crucial actually, because for instance, um, uh, when Portia Maltzby talks about how she went to Indiana, she talks about it as a, a, an outflow of Lois Anderson's keen eye looking for places that might be interesting for her mentees. So because of that, Lois Anderson suggested she look at Indiana because she had this inclination that it had an opening for black music research. And so yes, the keen eye of those who know institutions as well as the agency of those who choose to go to these institutions um, uh, is, is really, really important. But I think the idea of relationships the relationships of, you know, the people who are, you know, advocating for, for you is always there um, uh, in any configuration and always needs to be there. Yeah, it's funny. Um, th this makes me think a lot about um, the, some, some advice we sometimes give students who re relocate to, um, to Alberta to study composition, <laughs> which is, um, I, I'll just put it this way. I, I myself have moved a lot in my life. And, um, and one of the things that I discovered about being a composer and being and trying to be a community minded person is um, that every time I move, my work changes drastically. Mm -hmm. and, and I've learned to warn students to let that happen. <laughs> because and whether, whether it's, it's scholarly work or, or any other kind of work, I ju it just seems like, um, especially in the last 20 years, there's something in the air in these institutions around really trying to, um, to take advantage of the communities in which we exist. Um, I know there's, I think there's been a long history in, in, in academia to bring people from all over the world with lots of specialties and try to like make a real potpourri mix of things. And I think that's still really powerful. 
but I, I really, I really value these kinds of um, alternative ways of thinking about being in an institution in a city like Edmonton or anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really it just, it's just very inspirational to hear you talking um, about it coming from your perspective too. So um, anybody have any other questions before we wrap things up tonight? Can I just say one last thing? Yes, that, please. that hearing you talk about us as uh, people who adapt, I mean, it just makes us think of, you know, the, the distances that are being decreased between humans and the animals and our environment, right? That is something, uh, if you look at Haraway or the, I mean, everybody is talking about this um, uh, as this adaptive environment, which of course connects quite clearly with indigenous practices of recognizing us as part of everything. And that's a great way to think of it. Why should we not adapt like, you know, a flower or a tree um, to a change in our climate um, is to find the best way possible for us and for the larger network of living beings that are that are within reach. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's spot on. Um, yeah. Um, well, so I, I think just before we thank Julia for her great presentation, I'll just mention that um, we are coming back in January with a whole slew of uh, of new talks. We're still putting together the schedule. Um, I do think that our first talk is Medhi uh, Rezenia, um, who some of you may know um, uh, is an ethnomusicology um, student here, but is also a composer and performer of Persian classical music. And so I, I thought I'd mention that because here we have someone who's going to be talking about Persian composition in a Western cl- uh, sort of quote unquote classical music program, uh, but he's in ethnomusicology. And so this this happens a lot here where we get folks who come here to study ethnomusicology, but are actually mad performers and, co- and composers. And it's one of the things I love about this institution because you know, if Medhi ever wants to take a composition lesson with me, he's welcome because I'm the one who will learn. <laughs> and that's just, that's a wonderful place to be. So anyway, I hope some of you can come and see his talk. I think his is the next one. I will, uh, Tom and Gail and I will be putting together the schedule for next term uh, very soon. And I do want to thank Tom and Gail Mandrick and Oliver Rossier, as usual, for uh, helping me run this, this ship um, and keep it, keep it on course. And thanks to Julia for a wonderful wrap up to the semester um, with a very inspirational talk. And I do want to encourage you all. Um, it, she mentioned that there's the, this film that she's been working on. I don't know if there's any um, news about its quote unquote release, but I know we did have a screening of part of it um, a couple of years ago, and I'm looking forward to uh, whatever the final version is, and we will keep you all posted um, when that comes out uh, and make sure everyone can check that out because it's the film is beautiful, at least the parts that I've seen. So, um, all right. Uh, so if you'd like to unmute yourself and clap or yell or make some other kind of noise, do it now. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody.